you know, may offend any of you, just let me know. I'll do better, like offend you more. Um, <laughs> well, if there are things you want to talk about, let's have them. Olivia. Oh, you shouldn't. Let me approach this in a couple of ways. Is that okay? And forgive me for self-indulging, but, you know. When I was waiting for my chest to be cut open, for some strange reason, I began to think about my life. It's a very strange thing, you know. When I mean, you're about to die... And you begin to think about your life. Good morning. And then um, I said to myself, well, if I make it alive out of this, I'll begin to eat differently. I'll begin to appreciate the things I have in my life, including my kids who say nonsensical things all the time. I'll start exercising. That's not related to the bedroom. I thought that the surgery would make me a bit more serious. Life, the end of life, all that. It didn't. And I suppose if death was a human being, like an angel who would knock on my door and say, take me seriously, I'll take you. In the next couple of weeks, I'm not really quite sure if I would have the capacity to take death seriously, my life seriously, the value of my life seriously, because it really does take a lot of effort to take it seriously. Let me change directions now for a moment. I'm 60. I've had some experiences, some good, some bad, some neutral and different. I have more time behind me than ahead of me. I come to class, this is a philosophy class, for the most part. The sort of things we talk about are, I think, profoundly serious. And you would think that I would want to come to class and bang these ideas into people's skulls, not laugh, you know. But that's not the case. Uh, the truth is, I can make anyone of you I can't force anyone to be serious about these things. Everything has its own time. Uh, and someone who's not in the right place in life should not take this stuff seriously. The truth is, let's say you're in a relationship and you love your companion, and you come to this class and we examine the various natures of love. Well, you're 18. Uh, perhaps this is the first person you've ever fallen in love with. You didn't have a father, didn't have a mother. This is the only person who has given you access to this particular emotion, which is profound and valuable. You shouldn't take the comments I make about love in this class seriously, because you'd go home and your relationship would fall apart. Why would you want to take that seriously? So it really depends where you are, who you are, at what stage certain things should be serious, and certain things should be casual. Add to it the fact that I would put an extreme amount of stress on myself, that I'm going to come to class, I'm going to look at people, I'm going to force them to take me and my ideas seriously. The truth is, people in this class are at different places in their life. And you also have mood swings. You know, you're serious for 10 minutes, and then you kind of become casual. You know, you're awake and inspired and excited, and then all of a sudden your mood changes and you're completely bored. So it's one of the ways that you can just uh, understand a few things and just come to class and have a good time. There is something that Plato had mentioned, and we'll talk about Plato in some weeks, Hello. if ever at all in this class. There is only one thing that's worth taking seriously under the sun, and that's your soul. 
And if you don't believe in souls, your mind, the way you think about things, your emotions, uh, how you're nothing but a container of advertisements. And just examine that. And uh, take yourself seriously. And leave the rest of us alone. And uh, just in case you have taken yourself profoundly seriously and you've come to them, some really, really good conclusions, find the right customers. If you haven't found the right customers to listen to you, don't force them to listen to you because they're not. And even if they were to listen to you, they probably wouldn't understand you. And you don't want that. Sometimes you go somewhere only to vent and sometimes you go somewhere to be understood. If you're a place where you want to be understood, then you're not going to vent just in anybody's ear. You're going to be very selective. If you want to be serious, be serious. It's a good thing. Just be very selective. You know, it really, for the most part, is like you have worked really hard for the past three, four years, and you've saved about $20,000, and now it's time for you to buy a car. It'd be foolish of you to just go to one dealership, see the first car, buy that car, and then walk away or drive away. As someone who is, knows the value of the youth, the time, the sort of things you have to sacrifice to save up $20,000, you're going to go into like five or six dealerships. You're going to test drive you know, 10, 15, 20 cars and then drive out with one. And that's how you should use people. You know, figure out, they're like vehicles. Figure out who's serious, who's going to take you seriously, who finds you valuable. It's very much like sleeping with people. You know, uh, there is a stage in your life where all you think about is sex, perhaps, and you just want to sleep around. There's nothing wrong with that as long as you, you know, exercise or practice safe sex. There comes a point where I don't know how it happens or when it happens or for whom it happens. You say, you know, my body has value. I have value. My history means something. I want to go out with someone who takes me seriously. And now you become very selective. And if before you were intimate with people like five times a day, now it's like five times a month, then it becomes five times a year, and then you'll be never. Does that? And there are also things you should be serious about and things you shouldn't be serious about. You shouldn't take people seriously. It's not valuable. You should take the right people seriously. If your mom gives you a piece of advice, take it seriously. If your 18-year-old friend gives you advice, don't take them seriously. If your mom says, this guy is no good for you, take that seriously. If the guy says, I'm good for you, don't take him seriously. I'm sorry. If you're speaking of, let's just say, an adult, someone who pretends to be one like me, uh, what you are confronted with is, unfortunately for you, and maybe tragically for me, I come to class with a good amount of power. And my experience of 30 years being in the classroom also gives me more power. And having read all sorts of books also gives me more power. And, and so I'm profoundly arrogant, self-centered. And when you say something to me, even though it may have great value for you, great meaning for you, significance for you, uh, I'm just going to categorize you as this 18-year-old who has as Trump would say, concepts, but unexamined concepts, so they're not really valuable. So when you say, let's talk about love, I don't really care why you're asking that question. I'm just going to say, okay, let's talk about something else. And you say, well, what the hell, man? I, you know, I, I, I'm asking this question because of ABCD. It's very important for me to kind of ask this question and kind of hear a perspective. And this guy just dismissed me. Am I not being taken seriously? And the answer is no. Um, If you're talking about your parents taking you seriously, parents can't take their kids seriously. You're always going to be a kid. I'm 60. My mom's 80, my dad's 90. I call them every day when I'm driving home and every day before I go to bed. I can't tell you. Our conversation is nothing but them giving me advice. 
And once in a while, you know, I get really, really tired. It's like I have a bad day in the classroom. Like some person named Olivia keeps harassing me with her insignificant questions. And, you know, I'm stressed. I'm frustrated. And now here's my mom. She's blabbering on about how I should live my life. And then I scream. And then she says to me, I mean, remember, I'm your mom. You're a kid. You know, I nursed you for the first, like, three years of your life. And I say, Mom, I'm going to go to Safeway. I'm going to buy you 10 gallons of milk. We'll be even. <laughs> uh, so it really depends on which adult you're, what kind of adult you're talking about. Uh, you know, I've never really enjoyed people with power. Uh, someone, like in my position, who walk in the classroom, someone asks a question, or even... You need to begin to kind of just laugh and not take people seriously or just not take ideas seriously. I think it's, it's something happens to you with power. Um, and I think as I'm aging, I'm becoming much more mindful of that. And I try to be not so much of a jerk when I'm in the classroom. <sighs> there is another perspective to this. Let's say that I really, really like the way you ask questions, and I like your body language, and I like the way you sit and you listen as we kind of just have conversations. And then your hand goes up, and you ask questions, and you want to be taken seriously. I don't want you to take, I don't want to take you seriously. What I want, I want you to take me seriously. And the way that works for me is that I need you to put pause, all of your thoughts and emotions. Just listen. You're not going to understand much because of the age gap, because of the experience gap, because cultural gap. Just shut your mouth. Just sit back and listen and come and visit me in the office. Let me make you coffee. Just sit there and ask questions. And I won't say much in response. Because I have the things you want. And by that, let me just simplify it. You want to be successful. I've been around. I know various ways of being successful. You want a car. You want a house. You want a relationship. Maybe you want kids. Maybe you want your parents to respect you this way or that way. I've gone through all of that stuff. I know how that stuff works. You don't have what I have because you're still 18 or 19. You have another 40, 50 years to go. If you're able to process your experience as well. So I have things to offer you, but you have nothing to offer me except your ears. I'm not interested in your experiences. I'm not interested in your life. But I do take you seriously. Should you ever be able to put yourself on pause? If that makes any sense. Um, you know, I have nothing against therapy. What usually happens is we push things down into the dungeon somewhere inside us. And then uh, you think that just because you don't see things, uh, they don't really have much force or play in your life, and, but they do. And after a while of many failed relationships, whether it's with a class or a set of ideas or your work or relationship with your parents, whatever the case may be, you realize that you're now 30, 40, 50, and things haven't worked out too well for you. And you're tired of repeating the same old stuff, like Groundhog Day, if you've seen the movie. Then you go seek a therapist of sorts. Let's just say the sort of therapist that you find, if you've seen that show on HBO, I think, um, it's no longer in play, uh, in treatment. It's a really, really good movie, uh, five seasons. The first season is really the best. If you find a therapist as caring as uh, how that guy is, after some time, you'll begin to kind of develop some trust, some faith, some liking, maybe loving your therapist. But then slowly, all the stuff that you have kept downstairs, you'll bring it up. The problem with bringing those things up is that these are things you didn't want to see because every time you saw them, emotions would come out. And every time the emotions would come out, you would use your intellect to figure them out. But you wouldn't be able to figure things out. You wouldn't have the tools to kind of figure out what the hell to do with all those emotions and then the thoughts. 
and then you get sad and depressed and you say it's best not to see them okay so the first thing that happens is your therapist brings the stuff out then you have to see them and then for the first time hopefully by then you'll be a bit more mature that you just don't go completely nuts uh, with the help of your therapist, you begin to see them, feel them, think about them, and then slowly you'll be given tools to process them. That's a lot of things to go through. See them, feel them, think about them, find the tools, fix them, and then hopefully go out there and make sure you don't repeat the same old mistakes. Um, I, I think there is a shortcut. It's, it's a difficult thing to do, and it's not part of this culture's narrative, but it's in my culture's narrative, which is find someone, find a grandparent if you have one. And if you think they're wise, submit yourself to them. Let them take advantage of you. Take advantage of your youth, your time, your energy. Uh, and of course, if there's a sense of attraction, you go to them. Every time you go, they say, okay, here's the shovel, go to the farm and plow the land. And once in a while, they'll give you a piece of wisdom. And every time you open your mouth, one of them complain, they kind of slap you. But because you love him, you're not going to walk away. And you realize that he's doing your therapy, but in a completely different way. He doesn't give you a chance to talk and vent and talk about your own old stuff. He's been there, he's done that. The only way you can kind of overcome is by him being a bit more intense as a force of trauma. Your life is traumatic. I can also be traumatic. If I can be more traumatic than your life experiences, what you realize, you'll think more about me than your trauma. That's the shortcut. And that's the best shortcut you will ever take if it's ever offered to you. If that was to be like a real scenario, if I was to become a trauma or a hurricane in your life, in about five years' time, you'll be teaching a class like this. And then you can use Plato to vent your ideas, your past. That's what I do. My shortcut will give you a job, will give you ideas, and will give you an audience. Your shortcut is loneliness for a long time. It wouldn't be worth it. Are we... I'm sorry, I didn't mean to be like that, but please, Rosa. Um, in the last class, you said something about how once you get something, you always you have like a privilege over another, and um, it made it seem like to be uh, free from like that, you have to like, like, are you like trying to say that complacency is what people should strive for, and how do we deal with being like that? Can you say your question a different way? Because I, I have forgotten what happened here on Tuesday. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and I don't do drugs, and yet I forget. Is complacency what people should strive for, and how you deal with feeling of inadequacy? If by complacency you mean sloth or just being lazy, no, kind of like passive. Yeah. Temperamentally, some people are just passive. I, I am temperamentally passive. I don't like to. Hello, Kendra. I don't like to confront people. I'm not confrontational. I don't like to get into fights. Unless you really, really push me, then I will go for your juggler. Okay. So temperamentally, I'm that. The other aspect of being passive is hello, getting. I value that a good amount of who and what I am and a good amount of my value really depends on how you see me. I, I don't have a perspective about myself in the absence of you. Without you, I am zero. 
with you and worth 10 bucks. So whenever you push me around, you bully me, and even though I know it may be wrong, I become very passive to it because I just value what you have to say and how you perceive me. The other aspect of it has to do with the fact that inadequacy, let's just say. Um, let's say you've read a couple of lines about Plato, and I've read the entire dialogues of Plato. So you've read one page, and I've read 3,000 pages. You've thought about Plato for a day, I've thought about Plato for about 30 years. Okay. Now you raise your hand and you say, well, Plato said love A, B, C, D. And then I ramble on for about three hours about what Plato actually said about love. Okay. Well, you have no choice but to feel inadequate. You haven't read much. You don't have much experience. You haven't really thought and reflected about this. It's good that you actually feel inadequate. And it's good that this particular inadequacy creates this sense of humility about you. It's good. When you feel inadequate in some ways, it means that you're confronted by something that is better than you are, bigger than you are, stronger than you are. I'm not going to go into a ring with Mike Tyson. I'll go into a ring with a five-year-old who's like a mouse. I can beat them up. I feel powerful, but not that guy. You know. So in some ways, feeling inadequate is very insightful on your part. You know your space, you know the environment, you know what's in front of you. And something instinctual tells you this is how you should behave. Be passive. Bow. Shut your mouth. You know. Uh, the other aspect is why would you want to talk about Plato? You're 18, you haven't really read much or thought much. You've lived in a philosophy class and there are like 50 people sitting in this room. In this room. It's good that you feel inadequate because you're not going to get embarrassed. They're not going to laugh at you. If you feel inadequate about something and then you're passive about it, that's a different story. If I say you're going to get a C in this class, you kind of feel inadequate. But there are ways you can improve your grade. But that takes active engagement. You can be passive to the desires of being slothful, lazy, complacent. But you have to be active in an engagement. It's very much like therapy. You become passive to the voices inside your head and active to the voice of your therapist. There is nothing wrong with feeling... You know, I had... I worked with um, a guy for about 10 years. I consider him now to be my teacher. He died two years ago, three years ago, uh, due to cancer. For 10 years, every time I went to his house, I felt inadequate. Every single day. And we used to sit, and he used to talk for about six, seven hours, each gathering. It was only much, much, much later, when I started teaching, when I became a bit more comfortable in teaching, but then I began to stand up to him when I felt that what he was saying was wrong or inadequate or incomplete. But that took about 20 years. But that feeling of inadequacy and then humility and knowing that this guy has things that I will never have in my life, okay, it allowed me to be quiet, to listen, to take notes, to hopefully get some tools and then apply them later on in life. Uh, you know, the feeling of inadequacy is like, kind of like an alarm clock. It says, you, know, you just don't know. You're incompetent. Now you have a choice, now that you become aware. You know, it's like an alcoholic who says, I'm only a social drinker. Fine. Okay. Uh, then ultimately he comes to realize he is in fact an alcoholic. Well, okay, well, this is the awareness. You've realized this. You can either be passive to the wisdom that has given to you by your own intellect, your own body, your wife, your husband whatever, okay, or you can become active. Passive in the sense that I don't really care, I'm going to continue to drink. Active in the sense that now I see it's ruining my body, it's ruining my life, I'm going to go to AA. It also depends who is making you feel inadequate. Let's say you like music. And God forbid, let's say you gravitate towards Snoop Dogs. 
form of art, if you can call it that. And every time you try to mimic him, you feel inadequate. Well, that's a shitty way of feeling inadequate. You want to feel inadequate? Listen to Mozart. Let people who have some talent, some value, make you feel inadequate. Uh, you may be interested in uh, one of the plays that was written by Jean-Paul Sartre. Uh, he was one of the fathers or founders of existentialism, even though I think it's been around for a long, long time, and it's called No Exit. No Exit is about three people being locked up in a room. And you can take this metaphorically. And what all these people have in common is that they have certain needs. They don't have what they want, or they don't have what they need. And that is what makes them feel so inadequate. And they desperately need the other people in the room to tell them what they want to hear. Like, you feel ugly. And that's generally how you felt your entire life. But there is no one else in this room except me. Well, you have a couple of options. You can either behave in a way that I'll continue to tell you, Rosalind, you're ugly. Or you come to me and say, Amir, do you have any needs? I say, yeah, I need money. I say, okay, but well, why don't I give you like 10 bucks and in return you tell me how beautiful I am? I say, okay. And what Sartre wants to argue is that if you feel adequate or inadequate because of the judgments, perceptions of other people, people are always going to lie to you. First, because people in general are incompetent, their job, judgments are incomplete and biased, okay? And why the hell would you want to depend on them? Now, I think Sartre should have gone a step further. Find the Socrates, find the Jesus Christ, find the Malcolm X, they'll really make you and your life feel cheap. That's a good cheapness to feel. I don't know if you have a brother or a sister. And I don't know if they're like talented in, say, school, writing essays. Or maybe your brother plays the violin or the piano. Let's just say. Okay? And your mom always tells you, see, why can't you be like him? And envy grows, jealousy grows, anger grows, hatred grows. Maybe once in a while, like Sigmund Freud, you pray that you could summon the will and cut his juggler, right? So your mom can never force you to compare yourself to your brother. But eventually what you say is, my brother feels me, makes me feel cheap and incompetent and irrelevant and all that stuff. Maybe I should take a violin, and you do. And that competition is really good, it's healthy. I think. Yeah, yeah. Does that? Well, one way to comment here is um, my grandmother says what other people think of you is one of your business. No, your grandmother is wrong. Your grandmother is wrong. Is she still with us? Yeah. Tell her I said hi. But do tell her she's wrong. Um, well, when I was uh, doing my schooling, I had an instructor. Her name was Ruth Nyer. She was about 955 years old. I, I thought she was very attractive. Um, I have a thing for older women, like in their hundreds. And uh, one day when I went to her office, she was wearing this heavy makeup. And I said, oh, Professor Nair, you look really good. And she said to me, I am at an age where I can look however I want to. When you're young, you so heavily depend on other people's judgment for value and significance and meaning. It's like you need this class and you need this class because you want to go to a nursing school but you need me to like you. You need me to like your essays. Okay, so you're here solely for one reason. Great, okay. 
Now, let's say you have your schooling, you have your money, your life is quite intact. You're at a place where you say, I'm tired a little bit of just having the routine in life. I want to go and experiment with something. So you take this class and you write your essays. And the truth is, you just write the way you want to write. You don't really care what I think. You don't even care about the grade. You're at a different stage in life. For the most part, your life is complete. You have become a bit more autonomous, carefree, more free. You can do whatever you want. So your grandmother is right in the sense that, yes, in your 60s and 70s and 80s and 90s or above 100s, whatever. But if you're trying to make your life work for the first like 30, 40, 50 years, the social pressures are great, tremendous. You need other people to like you. So initially, yes, you need the judgments of other people and they need to be favorable. At a later stage, hopefully, if you've gained some maturity, don't care what other people say. That's good. So do tell your grandma I said hi. So why do we compare ourselves to... Well... Imagine you go to a party and you have dressed relatively well and you've put some makeup on and you think yourself to be attractive. And then you go stand next to Snoop Dogg, the female version. And, um, and they have no makeup on, which would make them look more hideous. But let's just say they put some makeup on, nice clothing on, and then they're standing next to you. Now, you left the house thinking that you're very attractive, and now you go to this party, and no one's looking at you, no one's paying your attention. They keep looking at Snoop Doggett, okay? And then you say, so what the hell? I came here for some attention, for some meaning. My value was supposed to go up. I, I was hoping to get lucky, but look at Snoop Doggett. She's getting all the attention. But why are you comparing yourself to her? Well, because that's what human beings do. You don't go to a party because you're complete. You go there because you're incomplete. You need things. You know. So compare and contrast are really, really good just in case you are going through some things and you go to a bookstore and you read a book or buy a book that says, don't compare and contrast. It's stupid. You need to compare and contrast because it's a good competition. The only thing that you need to be aware of is who are you comparing yourself to? See, I can ramble on for many, many hours, but I assure you if a Socrates or a Jesus Christ or a Malcolm X or a Mahatma Gandhi was to walk in this classroom, I'd probably like go way in the back and sit. And should one of you say, oh, Malcolm, by the way, Professor Sabzavari, I'm going to go, oh, shit, don't, don't call me Professor, not in front of Malcolm. And the truth is because his life is way up there. He's a thinker. He's an activist. What the hell do I do? Nothing. I read books. He lives the books. You know? Now, it's great for me to compare myself to Malcolm. Will he make me feel incompetent? Absolutely. Will he rob or steal value from me? Yes. Will I think twice about next time walking to class and someone calling me a professor? Yeah. Is that good? Well, if I can handle it, yes, because then I will probably work on myself to become slightly better. If on the other hand, I was to compare myself to like Justin Bieber or Snoop Dogg, well, shame on me. Why the hell would I want to compare myself to like a 20-year-old Bieber? So uh, comparing is good. It does create a healthy competition, especially if you have the resources to, uh, once you compare and you're made to feel cheap, then hopefully you'll have a nice toolbox that you can grab some tools and make your life slightly better. The other things, you need other people to kind of give yourself a certain value. It's good. Hello? Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, how do you actively live out your life's purpose? 
What? How do you actively live out your life purpose? How do you find your life's purpose? What is, how do you know what your purpose is? You know what you're assigned to I forget Gotham, I mean, I, I'm, yeah, just, that's like graduate stuff. <laughs> or postdoctoral. Um, I'll give you a couple of examples. You're born, the first billboard or set of billboards in your life are your parents. They're going to tell you your purpose. There comes a point where you don't find them as valuable, and now you depend on the judgments of your friends. And you're going to like some of them, you're going to love the others, and you're going to be indifferent towards them. Those whose opinions you really care for, they have power over you. And so they are a different set of advertisements, and you try to copy and mimic them. And they'll give you meaning and purpose for a while. Then, hopefully, we'll outgrow that and you go to school. And in school, you'll find people who come to class often. You'll find people who never come to class. You'll find people who talk often. You'll find people who don't talk often or at all. And that's a different kind of set of advertisement. And you say, okay, do I want to be like this or this or this or this? It also depends on your temperament and all that. Then you graduate. Okay. And if you examine... All the things that create meaning and purpose for you, you realize it's nothing but pieces of advertisements walking into your life, exciting you, enticing you, and then all of a sudden you have a purpose. Last night, I'm playing basketball with the kids. And I'm saying, I wonder what my wife is going to cook tonight. And all of a sudden my son says, Indian food, piece of advertisement. It doesn't take more than five seconds. We get everyone in the car, we go to an Indian place and we sit and eat. Piece of advertisement. Now, there is a long way and there is a short way. No different than what we talked about with Olivia. The long way is this. The world is like Costco. And you have a membership. The very fact that you're born, you're a member. Go around. There are lots of things out there that are going to capture your interest. And every time your interest is captured, you're going to pursue it for a while. And while some things will take about two weeks, some things 20 weeks. And there's a good chance that at the end of two weeks or 20 weeks or 20 months, you'll come to say, that was a complete mistake. Now, granted, when you're on your deathbed, you're going to look at everything as a complete mistake, but we're not there yet. Okay. So it's kind of like dating. And you and I have some age on us, and I guess Americans are just born old because, you know, they invite a lot of trash in their life. And so what happens, you begin to date things. And at the end of every day that turns into frustration and boredom, you realize this was a mistake. So a couple of things can happen. Your parents can say you're an American, go out there, knock yourself out. You're 18, get out of my house. And you go out there and like Costco, you go through the aisles. And then uh, at the age of 40, you look at your basket, you say, man, I have all the stuff. <coughs> Why? The shortcut is the following. That woman over there, her name is Kendra. And there are lots of people like Kendra who, you know, come by. I was a piece of advertisement. They just signed up for a class because they needed three units. Not to major in philosophy or humanities. They just wanted three units. They wanted to get out of Oakland, perhaps. But for some strange reason, they saw this particular piece of advertisement interesting. And that interest pushed them to the library. They began to read some books. 
they didn't know, you know, what's going to become the end of it, but they said, oh, well, I'm interested, let me just go. And then they said, you know what, let me sign up for another class, and another class, and another class. And then at the age of five, or 25, they said, you know what, since I'm going to waste my life, why not just waste my life on philosophy? I'll go to school, get a degree. But Amir said a few times, another piece of advertisement, exit his mouth, that should you get your master's, maybe you can start teaching. It's all advertisements. They went out there, they got their masters, and now they teach. Now, whether or not you're going to be good in the classroom, that's a shot in the dark. You will never know until you step in it. Is it true that you're going to be boring? Yeah. Is it true that you'll have moments of inspiration, excitement? Yeah. Is it true that you get paid like 200 bucks an hour? Yeah. Is it true that you have an audience? Yeah. Is it true that it becomes like a therapy session for you? Absolutely. Is it a good purpose to have at the age of 25? Fucking yeah. Why then would you want to go out there, experiment with all sorts of things, find most things to be meaningless, and you look at yourself in the mirror, you say, ah, oh, shit, you look ugly, wrinkly, smelly, who'd want you? Nobody. We don't even want you. So if you want meaning, find someone you can compare yourself to. Figure out where Angela Davis lives, or find her email, okay? Send her an email. Just say I'm a young African-American confused about who and what I am. Guide me. And should she open this email when she's in the right space, mentally, psychologically? Maybe she'll reply to your email. Or maybe she'll say, you know, I'm 80. I don't have time for this shit anymore. But should she be in the right space and email you? You're 20. And you're, you're having a giant walk into your life and giving you meaning and purpose and direction. That's the best piece of advertisement you will ever want in your life. Okay, so that piece of advertisement is going to be tough. Unlike Snoop Dogg, he's not going to say, you know, smoke, drink, have a good time, dance like an idiot. She's going to say, you know, you need, I'm going to push you to think a little. Talk about social justice, think about social justice and all that. It's painful, but it's rewarding. So you want purpose? Find someone in whom purpose has been realized. Then follow that person. If, for example, you see your mom and she's happy, you say, okay, well, how did she become so happy? She's a housewife, she's got five kids. You know, she complains once in a while. Well, that's, that's a good piece of advertisement. If, and, then, yes, ma'am. Um, so do you believe in like a great person theory or great man theory as called it, how history is moved forward by special individuals and not you know, cultural movements that are inevitable? I think before it used to be a bit more difficult. Now it's not as difficult because of technology. Consider for a moment when Trump came into the office. Has America been a racist country? Sure. Has it been built on bloodshed? As most countries, yes, but this place it is a bit different. To create a civilization, to live in civilization, i.e. society, do you need to repress emotions? Do you need to keep your mouth shut so that you could continue to have friends, can continue to have your job, people can like you? Yeah. You need to do all those things. I mean, you're, if the moment you walk in society, you have no choice but to be political. I mean, some of you in this class don't like this class. Fair. Some of you don't like me. That's fine. But you're very political. You know you need the grade. So you pretend. And even though you don't want to ask questions, you say, oh, attendance, participation, worth 100 points. I'm just going to raise my hand and talk about shit. Why do people shit? Well, that's a question. That's participation. That's an act of politics, which is good. You're aware. Now, America is about 300 years old. Since the 1960s, let's just say, we have been a bit more civilized. Maybe you don't like brown people who look like me. But because of diversity, inclusion, equity, all that nonsense, 
even though you don't like me on the inside, on the outside you say, Professor, oh yeah, okay. You raise your hand, you're very civilized, you're very respectful, fine. With the entrance of Trump, all the things that you and I repressed, all of a sudden shame went away. You could just be a savage and then talk to people the way you want to talk to, the way you feel like talking to. You don't like me, just say it. I don't know if you have gone back and looked at the debates of you know, previous presidents or candidates. The way they spoke, the way they used language, the way they just looked at each other and spoke to each other, very different than the moment Trump entered the political scene. Everything has changed now. So is it true that possible for one person to change the entire culture? Absolutely. In the past, you needed one person, yes, to kind of be a spark. And then that had to be fueled for many, 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 many weeks, if not months or years, until change happened. Now it doesn't take that much. So how do you think like the American ideas of liberalism how that change that so much or that one's you know special and unique and how that's different than a lot of other cultures which are more part of the cultural mass? How do you think that sort of affects our idea of you know well, look, uh, you can go to the Middle East, leave your parents' house at the age of 18, get a job, buy a car, buy a house, go to school. Those opportunities don't exist. You can't do that in Mexico. You can't do that in India. You can't do that in China. Here you can. Opportunities are a lot and great. It makes it possible. You can leave your parents' house at the age of 18. Education is not the only way to be successful and to be happy. You can, uh, at the car wash, there was a guy who had a hot dog stand. Monthly income, $60,000. Where the hell can you go on this planet to sell hot dogs and make 60000 Nowhere. And look at now. Go to YouTube, TikTok. Uh, there is a guy, Cristiano Ronaldo, beautiful soccer player. A couple of weeks ago, he created for himself a YouTube channel. In one day, he had 20 million subscribers, which means his monthly income just from YouTube alone is about $200,000. These days, especially now, you can be an individual, but only in the sense that you are not going to need other people as much. You can buy a car. You don't need to ask your father for money. You don't need to stretch out your hands. You can go to Costco, buy yourself some stuff. You can even buy sex. You can buy all sorts of things and be profoundly independent. Only near the end of your life, you may realize how lonely you really are, but that's a different story. Yeah, in privilege, you can be independent and you can be individual and there's nothing wrong with that. There is a, uh, yeah, okay, so. Yeah. yeah, good luck. A anyone else? Yeah. <laughs> I was trying to f <laughs> remember your name, but it's not Sophie. Wolf? Yes. Escapism? Escapism. There was an American psychologist by the name of Eric Fromm. Was it Eric Fromm? I think it was Eric Fromm. Yeah. He has, this, he has a lot of good books. Two of them you may be interested. One is called The Art of Love or The Art of Loving. I read it in Persian, so that's why I'm giving you an inaccurate title. But it's somewhere there. And the other is called Escape from Freedom. <sighs> Ask a different question. No, no, don't look at her. So 
It was a very simple exercise that escaped from freedom. When someone gives you freedom, you realize there are all sorts of things you can do. You have all sorts of options, but that is a burden. It's a cross you have to carry, and the truth is your back will break. It's like when you, sometimes the two of you want to go and have some dinner. You say, well, what do you want? Anything. Okay. Uh, pizza? Yeah, anything is good. Okay. Now, you know pizza is not really way up there. How about Indian food? Okay. Taco Bell? Yeah, maybe. Well, is there anything, and you realize you're giving her options? She's not choosing one. She's saying whatever. And all of a sudden, a fight breaks out. What's wrong with you? Why can you never make a decision? Why are you so passive? You're such an idiot. I don't want to be with you anymore. What? It just started with Kentucky Fried Chicken, and now you guys are breaking up. Okay. And what from Eric from argued was that none of us desire to be free. It's too much for us. We want someone to tell us what to do, which is part of our organism, really. You know, uh, you like to go somewhere, see something, be excited, be interested, and then focus your attention on that one thing. That's who and what we are. We like bias and prejudice because it doesn't force us to think too much. It's good not to have perspectives. If you want to have a lot of perspectives, you'll be like Jesus Christ. Everybody will crap all over you. You know, you're always going to be turning the other cheek. Moses, on the other hand, he says, no, I'm not going to be as free. There are rights and wrongs. Other perspectives, sure. Do you have crummy parents? Yeah, I'm not going to honor them. Or I am going to honor them. Okay. Escapism is really, really, really good because the flip side is freedom. Freedom brings in too many viewpoints and you don't know what to do with them. There is another aspect to escapism. Let's say you ask a question and I embarrass you in this class and you happen to be a very sensitive type. Okay. I'm cruel, I'm a lion, you're a lamb, okay. The truth is when you leave this class, you're gonna to talk to her for a little bit and she's gonna give you some comfort, some solace, but the truth is whenever something about you breaks, you're always going to be alone. Is it true that you're going to use other people as a, so some a venting mechanism? Sure, but at the end of the day, you, it's you and your thoughts and your emotions and the experience alone, okay. If you were to think about the fact that I bullied you this entire class and embarrassed you in front of 30 people, you wouldn't be able to sleep, you wouldn't be able to eat. Especially if you came to this class feeling inadequate and I make you feel that even more. And that will plunge you into depression. Inside you and I, there is a mechanism. It's called forgetfulness. We escape to forgetfulness. It's good for us. We don't want to remember the horrifying things that life offers us. And I assure you, kind of like therapy, you will forget what your parents have done. You will deliberately forget. But then after a while, when you realize that everything you touch or everything you have touched has turned into dust, your own mechanism will bring those things up and say, it's time for you to remember. But at this stage, you have the capacity to see them. Your skin is thick. It doesn't mean that you won't get bloody, but your skin is a bit thicker. You can handle the pressure much better than before. So escapism good? In some instances, yes. Now, let's say um, we talked about self-sabotage on Tuesday. You know, sometimes life forces you to see things and then your own mechanism says, rise up, make some changes. But the truth is making changes to anything, it's a difficult thing. If you haven't cleaned your room for two weeks and all of a sudden someone says, clean this goddamn room, it smells like crap. 
Well, it's a good reminder, but the truth is you have to kind of take a couple of days off of work, you have to not do school stuff, and then you have to clean this mess. You know, and while you're cleaning, you're going to think about the classes you're missing, the assignments you're missing, attendance, participation, zero. You may get laid off from your work, all that stuff. And so you say, you know what, I'm just going to not look at my room for a while. I'm just going to sleep in my sister's room for a couple of days and not, you know. And that's what happens. It's good to escape if you know what you're escaping from. And you escape only because something about you says it's not right, the right time. Nothing wrong with that. Uh, let me, uh, what time is it? Let me just tell you something about escapism. It's what? Oh, yeah, 15 minutes. There are some things I think human beings just can never, ever, ever escape from. And it's our own existential angst. Rusa fikr mani nas tu hamish shab sukhanam ke chara farag ahwal dil khishtanam. As ko jo amad am amadan bahre chhod be ko jo amira wa maakhar na na maayi batanam. That once in a while I just wake up and I ask, what the hell am I doing? Why is my life so meaningless? So this, so that, so empty. And these are things that are going to stay with you for a long, long time. Now. Some people, like Tolstoy, have the resources to push the questions away. They come back, they wrestle with them, okay? Then they push the questions away, these questions come back, and as you age, the questions come back with greater force. The older you get, the less time you have, the less energy you have, the more life pushes you into reflecting and evaluating your life, and that's tough. Especially when you come to examine your life and find it to be hollow, okay? So, a lot of things in life we can escape from. Hugh Hefner escaped old age by hanging out with young people. Nothing wrong with that. Okay. Hugh Hefner escaped from some sexual incompetency by taking Viagra and other forms of drugs. Okay. Nothing wrong with that. But I think when it comes to certain other parts of our psyche, there is no escaping. Let me just bring this down here a little bit. If I was to be brutally honest, whatever your issues in life may be or anybody in this class, life demands that you have power if you want to survive it. However way you feel about anything, your past, future, whatever, stay in school. Take the classes. Don't like the instructors. Do whatever you can to pass them. Get the hell out of Laney as soon as you can. Go to a four-year school. Okay, just put whatever crap lives inside you that's haunting you, put it on pause for about four or five years, if you can. Do the most unenjoyable thing, which is going to school and sitting in classes and listening to people like me. Once you have power, that power will create enough distraction from your trauma because by then you will start looking for a job. And then that job will busy you. Then you won't think about the traumas as much. Then you will wait and wait and wait and wait till you're 35, 40, 50. Once your life has settled a little, now you can wrestle with all the stuff that has lived inside you. But you approach it with power. And hopefully you're not suffering from chronic depression. What if we are suffering? I'm sorry? What if we are suffering? So, there are a couple of ways to look at this. Uh, and I think we've talked about this before. Some depressions are the outcome of just bad brain chemistry. And if you just go to Kaiser, talk to Dr. Julia Roberts, and she'll you know, prescribe some medication. And over time, some things about you will adjust. 
then you have one of the things about America individuality is that you're trained by the culture from a very, very early age that you have to take care of your own life. We have this neighbor, once in a while, they bring their kids over. And one of them happens to be like five. And once in a while, she throws a temper tantrum. And the father says, well, sit somewhere and figure out your emotions. She is five. Maybe you need to spank her. Maybe you need to talk to her. Maybe you need to give her ice cream. But don't tell her at the age of five. That independency at that age is going to be a traumatic experience later on. Because she's going to assume that every time life breaks her, she needs to sit somewhere and figure things out. And the truth is, you can't. You need other people. But when you push people into this staunch individuality, you'll turn them into a beast. And beasts can't just go out there, kind of like Trump. Just handshake, you know, shake the opponent's hand. Be a bit more social, a bit more communal. But when you lose that ability, well, then you have to, have to do everything on your own. So part of depression that turns into chronic depression is the fact that we are such staunch individuals. They did this study in Texas that asking help from other people, in fact, is an embarrassing thing. I mean, think about that for a moment. You're lost. You're driving. You want to find where make headed the restaurant, the Persian restaurant is in St. Texas. But you're not going to stop and ask anyone because it's a cause of embarrassment. I mean, how stupid is that? As a human being, when you're born, life offers you experiences. What we do is we interpret those experiences. And if you don't have the proper toolbox, your interpretations are always going to be negative. And so when you keep interpreting experiences as negative, that becomes a cause of depression. Okay? So a good amount of interpretation has to do with cultural narratives. What is this culture selling you? Okay. Now, the more industrialized a culture is, a society is, the more depression it's going to have. Individual depression. You have also cultural depression. Cultural depression means this. زمان بشنوی پیر آموزگار مکن تکه برگردش روزگار که این منزل درد و جای غم است در این دامگه شادمانی کم است. It's a Persian poem and you can find millions of these lines and what they have in common is the following. If you want happiness down here, you're not going to find it. If you want trouble down here, you're going to be bombarded by them. Marriage, it's not going to make you happy. Job, not going to make you happy. Happy, not going to make you happy for too long. And what you have is a culture that for the past 4,000 years keeps telling you there is a certain way to look at life. There's a certain way to look at people, to look at politics, to view happiness and success. Okay? And so that culture protects you from expecting ridiculous things for yourself and others. That's, that's a condom, psychological condom. That life is not going to go inside you, and you're not going to look at things the wrong way, expect the wrong things. Okay. Since you don't have that myelin sheet in this culture, that people are forced into living a very isolated, alienated life, you have no choice but to have a good amount of people just walking around being profoundly sad, lonely, depressed, and chronically depressed. And now your question is, what do we do with that? I don't know. Um, you can never change such illnesses on a massive level. You, know, you can maybe have one person stop smoking weed, but you can't have 50 people. It's just too much work. Unless you have a cult, and you train them in a certain way. By the time you get to a place of chronic depression, there are specific ways you think about things, specific ways you feel about things, specific ways you interpret things. 
you have specific kind of friends. In other words, you have this gigantic highway inside your brain now, and that's the only path you take. The only thing I can say, and I say this from personal experience, because we do have a friend who has been chronically depressed for many, 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 many years. We always tell her, our door is always open. Come have dinner with us. Hang out with the kids. Clean the backyard. You know, wash the toilets. Just don't sit home alone, especially if you're realizing that your past is beginning to harass you. Now, here's the thing. If you don't want to get more depressed, you need to put yourself in environments that will create pleasure. One of the things about pleasure is that it plunges you into the present. If I look at you and I say, fuck you, Everything about your past will go away. And the only thing you'll say, why is he cursing at me? Why is he being disrespectful? That shock will push you into the present. And that's the only thing you'll think about. If your brother's company is the only person you enjoy, hang out with him. Are you a burden in his life? Absolutely. If he loves you enough, he will carry that burden. Because when you have food with your brother, that gives you pleasure that moves you into the present. Even if your conversation is about your past, because you know your brother loves and cares for you, the conversation pushes you into the present moment. If on the other hand, you put your body in a space that pushes you to go back in time and then reflect about your bleak future, you're gonna get depressed more. Now, one of the reasons why depressed people enjoy depressing classrooms it brings about a reflection of who and what they are on the inside. That let's just say, for example, I am verse enough, proficient enough to talk about depression. Now, I put depression into language. All you have are the emotions. When I put your emotions into words, now you can see them. Now, kind of like the Gospel of John, now the spirit, i.e. emotions, have a container, a physical body we call language. Now you can see it. And once you see it, now you feel as if now you have entered a room. Now you can find intimacy with the words, i.e. emotions. You feel a little bit more at home. The depression doesn't harass you as much. You can use it as an act of creativity. But that usually takes a while. Um, some people say Van Gogh uh, killed himself. I don't know, shot himself. I don't know if that's true or not. But what I can tell you is the following. You have a man who was temperamentally depressed. Life experiences wasn't very kind to him. He used his art form. Was it the form of scape? Absolutely. Was it therapeutic? Definitely. He only sold one of his paintings that he got 400 francs for. He became rich when he died. Okay? If you have a craft that you are really, really good at, it can be your best therapist. If you can find a friend who can listen, best therapist. Uh, the most poisonous, toxic thing you can ever do is be depressed and be alone. And when someone calls you, you say no. Especially if the person who calls you, you like. Uh, in depression, you have physical paralysis. You lose, you lose a lot of desires. Nothing out there uh, is pleasurable. And you always have access to the future. Oh, I'm going to go there. We're going to talk for a while. And then what? I'm going to come home alone. No. So, we can talk about this stuff some more. I know that some of you are pressed for time. Uh, for those of you who are interested in these things, 
email me. I'll give you my phone number. And then download Telegram, the application on your phone. Message me on Telegram, and I'll send you lectures or audiobooks. Some you may like, some you may not like, you can delete. But at least, and they're free. So, anyone else before we go? Hmm? Maybe on Tuesday we'll talk a little about philosophy, what it is. Even though we've done it for the past four weeks. So, it's good to see all of you. Take care. Stay in touch. Uh, one last thing. If any of you in this class, like any one of you in this class, in other words, if you like other people in this room, whether they look good to you or smell good to you, whatever the case may be, go to them and ask for their number. And then text and call. And, you know, have coffee together. Talk about this stuff. You know, it's the best way to get to know people. In this class, because we're talking about these things, and some of you are putting yourself out there. And when you put yourself out there, other people see them. And then they like some of the things you put out. And I'm talking non-sexually. Should, of course, it becomes. And that's the bonus. All right, have a nice day.